Thank you very much. I was quite surprised when Carol said, come and do a chat about it, because for me it was um, a, a great privilege that the publishers, having reprinted this book four times without even telling me that's what they were going to do, this time agreed that I could add a bit, and more importantly for those of us with ageing eyes, I could have the typeface bigger. <laughs> because, because I lent it to a friend the other day who gave it back to me saying, I can't possibly read this. And so that made me think that, you know, maybe we could do better this time. Um, I haven't prepared a talk, um, but Carol said, could I just start off by saying why I wrote it? Um, and then one or two themes that have come out, because I had to reread it, you know, 17 years ago is a long time. So I had to reread it, partly be because I, before I did the final chapter, so I didn't contradict myself too often, um, but also so I could remember what I'd said and think about a few things to say today. But first of all, it is fantastic to see so many of you here that I worked with all those many years ago, and nobody looks a day older. Isn't that fantastic? So, <laughs> so that's brilliant. Um, so why did I write the book? Well, back 17 years ago, uh, two things really. One was my head was obviously full of Coram, and although I was leaving Coram, I wasn't, in, I wasn't retiring. I was retiring from full-time work, but I still had you know, plenty of energy left. And I thought, well, whilst all this is in my head, I should write it down before I forget. And the other thing really was that there weren't, well, two things. One was that um, although there's been a plethora of novels um, and other books written recently, I didn't think there was anything that was, if you like, for the man or woman in the street. There was the Nichols and Ray enormous fat tome that, um, and, and uh, the McClure book, which were both really um, written by academics for a more academic audience. There was Gillian Wagner's very scholarly book on Thomas Coram himself, but I didn't really feel there was anything very accessible on the history of this absolutely fascinating organisation. The other thing that um, seemed to me to be important was, um, I've just been talking to Lydia, who has been chair of the Old Coram Association, probably since it was founded a very long time ago. Um, and uh, like, like all of us, um, members of the former pupils are not getting any younger. And um, I wanted to have the opportunity to, um, to talk to people who had grown up in this institution while they could still remember what it had been like. Um, we did, uh, we did um, commission a piece of research that the Thomas Coram Research Unit did while I was here um, that told um, quite a lot of stories, but I also wanted the opportunity to be able to talk to people like Harold Tarrant, um, the first former uh, pupil to become a governor. Um, and I think the th one of the things that came out for me very strongly from, from that, and particularly from Harold, a, an amazing gentleman who lived into his 90s, he was, he was, yeah? Right. He was the first um, f found, for, former pupil to become a governor. He, he led a very successful career in business. Um, and yet, he, he wouldn't go on television because he didn't want anybody that he knew in his street to see him on television and know he was a foundling. Mm -hmm. And I think those of us... Um, who were perhaps, well, not, I don't cut myself as younger, but those of you <laughs> who are a bit younger will perhaps not appreciate just what the stigma there was in, in illegitimacy. I mean, it's called the Foundling Hospital, but it's never been about foundlings, ever. Um, but if they'd called it the Hospital for Illegitimate Children, nobody would have given a penny for it. Mm -hmm. So it was all a sort of marketing spiel to get people to feel sorry for these abandoned children. But as you probably know, the children were not abandoned. They were brought here by their mothers. And the mothers persuaded the governors that if they took the child, they, the mothers, uh, in, um, would never be contacted and would be able to get on with their lives. So it was, it was never a founding hospital. But, but the, the, it, it's very hard now, I think, for any of us just to realise just what it felt like. And, and, and some of you in the room who are familiar with that might want to say something more um, ab about it um, later. Um, I'm not, I don't know that I, I mean, I don't know that I need to go through the history because you'll either know it or you could read about it afterwards. Um, but I just, what I, so what I've done is just pull out a few themes that, that struck me that still have some resonance today. Um, L L L L um, uh, yet another book. Uh, how many of you have read Lily by um, 
um, Rose Tremaine. Now, I, I, I thought I'd read everything anybody had ever written about foundlings, but um, we were staying with some friends last week, and he was, uh, the, 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 the friend of mine was going to a book group and said, oh, I wish you could come and talk to our book group. We're, we're discussing Lily. And I said, what's Lily? And, oh, yet another book about foundlings. Um, so I got hold of Lily, um, and, uh, which, I was, which I was reading. Um, but I think that the first theme to strike me, which is absolutely critical to everything Coram does today, but was completely not available or there, right the way through the founding hospitals days, was this concept of resilience. What is it that when life throws things at you, helps you be able to cope? Because life is never easy for any of us. But if you have always been rejected, if you have never had any feeling of being able to succeed in anything, um, if always you have been told that you're not worthy to be here, that you, you've got to be educated to learn your place, there's nobody that loves you, your mother rejected you, this is not a really very good start in life, however much the founding governors put into the education and the health care of the children. And I think one, I came to Coram having a background in early childhood uh, development and, and education and um, uh, attachments, the work of Bowlby and so on. And um, if there isn't somebody in our early life that we mean a lot to and that we have a very close relationship with, then it's very hard for us um, as growing adults to be able to form good relationships through the rest of our lives. Now, this is absolutely at the core of our adoption service here, and um, Joe and others who've been part of that will, will, will testify to that. So whilst the founding hospital was way ahead of its time in giving the children a much better life than they would probably have had had they stayed in the workhouse or wherever with their mothers, there was no understanding of this need for people to develop a self of a sense of self-esteem, of having some control over their lives. Um, I was astounded to discover, talking to former pupils, that you know, the, when they left the founding hospital, they'd never even had to turn a light switch on and off. Um, because, is this right? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, so that no sense of control um, and no sense of somebody really caring about you. I was very struck. I remember so clearly talking to some adoptive parents here once who'd taken, um, who, who'd taken into their home, um, I'm not sure how much the, the youngster was, perhaps, perhaps about two, three, um, and, and this child being absolutely astounded to discover that mum had come in in the night to make sure the duvet was still on her. She couldn't believe that somebody cared enough about her that they would look after her at night as well as during the day. Um, a simple story, but I think, um, the, one, the two things they got really right, the governors, at the very beginning, were one, the fact that children spent the first five years um, in, uh, in the, usually in the country with what was called a, net worth, a, net, a wet nurse, we would call a foster parent. And usually, although obviously not always, um, that would have been a happy, relaxed time, not a great deal of money, but a, but a loving family. And that comes very clearly through this latest novel Lily and, and through most of the accounts that I've read of former pupils over the years. So there was the good beginning but then there was this horrendous and, and usually the, the youngsters thought this was their family. So imagine the shock of the doors of the foundling, the gates clanging behind them when they were five and came back to discover that this A wasn't their family and B they were never going to see these people again. So the early attachments were good, but they weren't allowed to continue. The other thing that was, I thought struck me as being quite far-sighted from the governor's point of view was that once the children left the founding hospital in the, in the early days, and on the whole, the boys left to go into, into uh, probably the army or the navy, the girls often into service, um, or into a trade in the growing prosperity of Georgian London, um, the governors kept in touch with the girls until they were 21 and the boys until they were 24, and they probably would have left at 14, 15, 16. So um, 
if they misbehaved, then the governors would come and tick them off and sort them out. But if they were mistreated, as was sadly occasionally the case, then the governors would find another placement for them and sometimes even take the, uh, whoever was um, running the business to court. So there was a sense of care and aftercare, but there was st still right the way through the founding hospital's life, a sense that you were second if not third class citizens and you would be educated to a point I mean, children were well educated by comparison to their peers. They learned to read, to write. This is the earlier days I'm talking about. To read, to write, to add up, um, to uh, read their Bibles. Um, but um, they were all, it was always absolutely clear that this was to prepare you for your place in society and your place in society was at the very bottom. The one redeeming feature, and I'm so glad um, that this is still part of, of life here today was music. Um, I think partly because of, I mean, you'll all be familiar with the, the involvement of Handel and Hogarth, I'm sure. Um, the fact that all children um, had music, had, had learned to sing. Um, Handel, of course, gave his first London performance of Messiah in order to raise money for the chapel that was being built. And um, the Messiah was performed every year thereafter until he died. And he, I think, played, conducted it from the keyboard until the last two years when he was too deaf. And uh, Philippa is here today to remind me of how we resurrected this Handel birthday concert 20, 25 or 30 years ago, whatever it was. Um, but music was, was um, and, and, and there were also many opportunities to learn instruments. Um, and certainly, in more recent times, nearly all um, the men, uh, the former male pupils, I'm not sure if it's the case for female ones, um, Lydia, uh, learnt an instrument and many of them went into the army bands to Keller Hall to train because um, they had the skills. Um, and one Charles Norden, who wrote uh, one of the probably m most widely read autobiographies, actually became a professor of music in Auckland in New Zealand. So music became, for, for children who felt they were nothing um, and, and, and really had to struggle when they left to, to, to make a life for themselves, music um, created a passport um, that was often able um, to uh, give them opportunities that wouldn't otherwise be um, open to them. And I know John Caldicott, who's also been long involved with, with the OCA, um, he's a clarinetist, is it? Yes. Yeah, and I mean, he's often spoken about the value of being able to have this skill as, as a sort of way of integrating um, into, into local communities. So concepts there of resilience and attachment, and of course we didn't have the insights of psychologists and psychiatrists back in the 1750s, um, and uh, you know the governors did the best they best the best they could. But I think that's one of the things that comes through most most clearly. Um, the the emphasis on education I've I've already mentioned. Coram, interestingly, was as interesting in, as, as keen to educate the girls as the boys, which was quite unusual in those days. He he argued justifiably that if the women were the mothers of tomorrow, then they needed the education just as much as the boys did. So girls and boys were were all well educated for their station in life. Um, and better educated than they would otherwise have been, I'm sure, had they not been in this, what's actually a children's home. It was called a hospital, but it was a big residential uh, children's home. Um, and um, obviously today, uh, both when I was here and, and now the work that Carol's taking forward, um, ensuring that children are, have, a, have a appropriate education and are Ment mentally and emotionally able to take advantage of that education, particularly youngsters who've been in the care system and been in and out of care. That's been a key theme, I think, of, of everything that, that, um, that Coram has, has been about. Um, I should have said under music, actually, that, that um, I think one of the best things that happened when I was here was when we set up the music therapy service as part of our, what was then a community campus to have a community facility for music therapy actually within, um, within 
these open access services. Um, it's quite difficult as an outsider. You can't sit and watch music therapy. It's very much a relationship between two individuals. But you can see a lot on a video. And watching um, some of the children, particularly children placed for adoption, who had had really traumatic early experiences, perhaps were elected mutes, hadn't said anything for ages, um, had, had very destructive behavior. Just watching uh, how the rhythms of the music and the, the skills of the music therapist could change um, this youngster into a child who was able to, be, to join in with others and enjoy playing music. I mean, it was absolutely incredible. And I know that creative music and the other creative therapies are still very much part of, of life here, aren't they? Um, just a, a quick word about people. Um, Coram was a very difficult man. Um, he upset a lot of people, but um, he was absolutely single-minded in his determination to set up the founding hospital. It took 17 years of traipsing the streets of London to persuade the great and the good, and he was not a member of the aristocracy. You know, this was not natural territory. Carol recognises, uh, reminded me, it's 17 years since I last uh, I wrote the book, so sort of synergy there. But um, he he was. Um, absolutely determined that he was going to get this institution up and of course he did it not through the landed gentry and the aristocracy but through what we would today call ladies who lunch um the um the ladies of um what not in distinction quality, quality. quality. ladies of quality and distinction and, and the museum had a wonderful exhibition um to commemorate 100 years of women's suffrage um, where they brought together the portraits of a lot of those ladies of qualities and quality and distinction. And, the, and um, these were mothers and sisters and daughters of the, the great dukes and earls of the country. And um, I think in the end what tipped it was the fact that there was quite a lot of illegitimacy amongst the aristocracy, but they, they, they were not made to feel ashamed. It was just quietly <laughs> hushed up. There were people called Windsor or whatever, actually in, in, came in, to the, anyway, so, if, <laughs> so eventually um, through these um, ladies of quality and distinction and their husbands and fathers and brothers and so on, um, so, the charter, so the charter was signed. Um, but it, it, it says on his um, epitaph that he had to learn patience, persistence and the art of petitioning. And I think but certainly um, that's something I had to, had to learn. Patience doesn't come very naturally to me. Um, and it's probably something you've had to learn. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think to say that sort of setting up and leading something um, is challenging and needs particular qualities. The other thing to say, though, is the extraordinary time and commitment, time and resources of the governors. In those days, I think there were sev several hundred governors, but they elected a general committee of about 50. And these people met every single week and they set absolutely everything up. They commissioned the building, they arranged to take in the children, they kept absolutely detailed um, notes through the billet books and so on, which you'll see on display here and over in the museum, um, of every single child, what they wore when they came in, what they were like, where then they, they had to appoint hundreds of nurses and thousands of foster parents um, and, and inspectors who looked, looked after the children and then bring them back they had to arrange the food. They managed to get the uh, king and kings or queens, whatever time it was, physicians to be part of the medical setup. I mean, the, the amount of um, detailed information and time that the governors spent and every child that left to be apprenticed, as I've already said, they would keep an eye on, they'd keep in touch with the, um, the people who were running the trade that, were they were, that the individuals were apprenticed to, etc., etc. A most extraordinary uh, commitment. And then, as now, uh, they are all volunteers. Um, and I imagine many of you are uh, uh, trustees or governors in voluntary organisations. Um, and sometimes those of us that are employed to run things get a bit frustrated when we think people are sort of interfering and telling us what to do and we'd rather do something else. No, I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> but but um, it, 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 it's, I mean, Coram has been so fortunate over the whole of its 
nearly 300 years, hasn't it, in the quality of the people that have, um, that have, that have come to serve on its governing body um, and as trustees. Some of them coming because, in, like in the old days, they've got links in high places, but mainly people with all kinds of different professional skills um, that any organisation needs in order to thrive. Um, and all of them with, with the, the um, focus on making a difference to the lives of the most vulnerable children um, at the centre. Um, a, a word about voluntary organisations or what other countries would call NGOs or non-governmental organisations. Um, there was four years in the life of the founding hospital when the government uh, gave it a grant um, to, in... Um, I can't remember what it, what it was. Was it called the Great? The General Reception. General Reception. General Re General Re anyway, was General Reception? Um, I, I've got it written down here and I can't see it for the moment. Any, anyway, um, and during that time, the, um, the, the organisation had to do exactly what the government wanted because it was being given money. And there was absolute chaos. Thousands and thousands of children came. Many thousands of them died because there weren't the resources to look after them and because they weren't well on arrival. Um, and it persuaded the governors then um, that, uh, to continue with what they had always done, to rely on donations um, and on uh, buildings and on sadly having to sell buildings and then move to Berkhamsted and sometimes to shut down successful projects. But at the end of the day, um, voluntary organisations are in a position to be um, very unbureaucratic, to be pioneering, to be innovative, to be flexible, to be uh, fleet of foot, to be responsive in a way that the state, however well-meaning, can't be. But it's pretty impossible for an organisation nowadays um, to rely entirely um, on the donations um, and support that it might get from people like you and others. Um, and one of the tensions that, that I certainly felt, and I'm not sure where Carol stands on this, is the way in which one is able to um, negotiate contracts at, at local level to do state business like placing children for adoption, uh, and at national level to get a co to take contracts to do a big piece of innovative work like the um, the um, courts and uh, drug, drug the drug the drug and alcohol courts um, it's really important that one has a good partnership where there is statutory funding but the exciting bit of being working in the voluntary sector and running a voluntary organization is being able to do things over and above um, what you are paid to do.